This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermi Sheikh. On Wednesday, Ukraine and Russia exchanged nearly 500 prisoners in the largest prisoner swap since Russia invaded Ukraine nearly two years ago. 230 Ukrainian prisoners were exchanged for 248 Russians. The United Arab Emirates helped mediate the deal. This comes after Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia fired 500 missiles and drones against Ukraine in just five days. Zelensky spoke Tuesday night. Since the beginning of today, there have been almost 100 missiles of various types, and the trajectories have been specifically calculated by the enemy to cause as much damage as possible. This is absolutely conscious terror. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin vowed to intensify attacks inside Ukraine after a Ukrainian attack on the Russian city of Belgorod killed at least 25 people, including five children, on Saturday. He spoke during a meeting with wounded soldiers at a military hospital in Moscow. We, too, want to end the conflict as quickly as possible, only on our terms. We have no desire to fight indefinitely, but we are not going to give up our positions either. Last month, the New York Times reported Putin has been signaling through his intermediaries behind the scenes that he's open to a ceasefire in Ukraine. For more, we're joined in Moscow by Nina Khrushcheva, professor of international affairs at the New School, the great-granddaughter of the former Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev. She's the author of The Lost Khrushchev, Journey into the Gulag of the Russian Mind, and co-author of In Putin's Footsteps, Searching for the Soul of an Empire Across Russia's 11 Time Zones. Her recent article for Project Syndicate is titled The West Must Face Reality in Ukraine. Professor Khrushcheva, welcome back to Democracy Now! Let's start off with the latest, um, the last week. Uh, Putin's intensifying attacks on Ukraine um, more than he ever has since the beginning of the war. Yet we get behind the scenes, The New York Times is reporting, he's signaling uh, that he's interested in a ceasefire. And then you've got this largest prisoner of war swap since the war began. Put it all together for us. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, well, these are not connected incidents, I'd say. Uh, the attacks on Ukraine, the largest since the beginning, also in some ways followed a very large attack or attacks in the last week, uh, last two weeks, I guess, on the Russian territory, because the Ukrainian forces also have been shooting, um, I think it was one day it was 300. Uh, 300 missiles. So it has been going on escalating. And the reason it has been happening is we heard so much about Ukrainian counteroffensive really didn't work out. The as it was hoped, then the um, uh, the aid from the United States and Europe somewhat is stalling. And so Ukraine was showing that it's fighting. So, of course, as Putin always does, the Russians fight back. So that's what we've been seeing. Um, as far as the New York Times reporting on signaling on, on, um, uh, on negotiations, uh, that's that's not how we see it here, because they mean some signs and and winks. But uh, Putin has been quite clear almost from the beginning, actually from the beginning, uh, that uh, uh, Russia is going to achieve all its goals. So Russia is, especially now when they're uh, when Russian forces are holding some territory, some Ukraine was able to uh, take back, but uh, a lot of it uh, Russia is holding. So that's that's the reality on the ground. He's been talking about. So, yes, he always gives the signals. As long as you're able to negotiate on my terms, I am willing. And as for the prisoner exchange, uh, yes, it was for a while that hasn't been going on. But uh, actually, in this particular part of the war, because we already had uh, 2014, uh, when Russia annexed Crimea and there was some military action, uh, this time the prisoner exchange actually has been going infinitely better. In fact, they were really trying on that front to keep uh, to keep with the war uh, uh, with the with the war uh, with the war rules 
And uh, Professor Khrushcheva, if you could say uh, more about the prisoner uh, of war exchange, how important it is, because there apparently, I don't know how much is known about how many Russian prisoners of war are in Ukraine, but there are reportedly thousands, over 4,000 Ukrainian soldiers still in Russian captivity. And then also, if you could say, uh, you know, what is the position of uh, the Russian military now? There are some reports that suggest that a large number of the fighting forces, pre-war, pre-invasion fighting forces, have been wounded or killed. And now the main people who are fighting uh, in Ukraine are former convicts and people who've been drafted who aren't very well trained. Is, is that correct? Well, it, not entirely. Thank you. Not entirely correct. Um, as for, we don't know how many thousands on each side actually they're prisoners. And of course, there's always prisoner exchange. I mean, I just want to warn, I'm not a war expert, but what I'm seeing, prisoner exchange is always some sort of a political, in many ways, always political manipulation. You give some, you take some. Uh, this is the largest one. Apparently, what, I, what I'm reading that um, uh, I think was 245 and 75 of them was not even negotiated. Somehow the Ukrainians just uh, gave them back. Uh, and this is for uh, a number of prisoners from the Azov Battalion. You may remember there was this um, uh, very famous Azov Battalion um, associated with the um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, hard nationalist uh, Ukrainian force, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of arguments whether they should go free or not. And so apparently, some of these people have been released from the Russian side. So this is the um, uh, this is what we are hearing. Also, that bit in December, there was a lot of talk that the new year is coming and it's important, and so we really have to have a good faith. Uh, as for those who fight in Ukraine, of course, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of casualties. We don't know once again how many, but tremendous amount. But what uh, what Russia figured out, what the Kremlin actually sort of figured out uh, somehow, uh, is that uh, it's not that conscript, conscript conscripts, but and so these are people who voluntarily fight. And many of those who come in voluntarily fighting, they did have some military training. And then there is this uh, Prigozhin we spoke about, I think, in the summer uh, during the Prigozhin coup, Evgeny Prigozhin, the Wagner chief who was uh, <clears throat> who was first pardoned and then killed for his uh, for his mutiny in, in June. Uh, he was the one who came up with that system that the prisoners uh, violent prisoners go and fight, and that's how they uh, they become regular citizens, so to speak. So a lot of them are in the army. They do go through some training. Russians, regular Russians, are very unhappy about that because a lot of these people come back and then commit violent crimes. But at the same time, it allows regular people also not to go and fight. And that's how kind of Putin was able, has been able to keep the semblance of sort of normalcy of the country at war, but not really the country at war. And Professor Khrushcheva, if you could talk about what conditions are like within Russia in terms of both how the war is being perceived there, uh, what ultimately the effect of the sanctions has been, what, what evidence you see of the effects of those sanctions today uh, in Russia, and the fact that uh, the majority of people there, uh, according to polls, do not support the war, and yet Putin has uh, over 80 percent approval rating still. And, and, and speak specifically, actually, in one of your pieces, you talked about this rural-urban divide, how right. the war is viewed in St. Petersburg and Moscow as opposed to elsewhere in the country, if you could, if you could talk about yeah. that. Exactly. I mean, and that's really a tale of two Russias. In the cities, uh, People try to stay away, pretend it doesn't happen, despite all the billboards and kind of volunteer uh, volunteer places where you can go and uh, and sign up. And in in the piece that you you, you mentioned, I 
you know, you go into a bookstore and all those people who are foreign agents, the one that been uh, been uh, uh, branded as foreign agents because they have not been supporting the war, the, the writers, uh, their books are available. You know, the all the sanctioned um, uh, sanctioned uh, you know chips and, and Mars bars or something. Uh, all of this is available, so you kind of wouldn't even know that there is war. And then you go deeper into uh, into cities uh, in Siberia. It was in in Omsk, uh, which is not very deep in Siberia, but but far enough. And there, uh, in the little villages, there are beauty salons all of a sudden just popping up because the widows uh, or those who are uh, women who send their sons and, and, and husbands to war uh, got a lot of money. I mean, it's actually something that uh, that's how the army now functions. Uh, it's uh, it's being people are being paid off. And these were poor regions. And now suddenly they're washing off in money. They can go to on vacation. They can can have some uh, summer um, uh, summer trips to warmer places and so on. And so this is kind of the, the dividing. I mean, Russia has, I mean, the double eagle is its coat of arms. It's always had this split personality disorder, the schizophrenia. But now it's visible more than ever in the cities. People pretend it's far away because they cannot stop it. But in smaller towns, in fact, they people are for Putin. They're not for the war, but they are for, so well, let's show the West that we are not going to surrender and whatnot. And also, I want to say that 80% is, is not the regular figure, but I would say that 60% is, is the support. And 56% want, want the war, want negotiations now, because, uh, because they feel that Russia, for two years, withstood the sanctions figured it out how to move on because sanctions are not that visible except for the inflation and and prices uh but other than that they just feel that now russia can end the war on stronger terms so we just have about a minute but the title of your piece the west must face reality in ukraine if you can talk about what that is what we're not understanding uh, particularly in the united states and how this leads into the elections in march uh, well, uh, elections in March, I mean, when Putin is going to become president again, yes, we, we don't call it elections, of course. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's that, you know, Joe Biden declared that he uh, he's going to uh, strategically defeat Putin because he cannot withstand the war. That has proven otherwise. In the piece, I call it the Stalingrad effect, when, you know, when the whole world is on Russia, is want to take Russia down, Russia sort of figures out how to do these things. And so the quick victory, as Biden promised, uh, over Russia is not going to happen. I actually really don't see how Russia can be defeated in this war. It's a country of 11 time zones. And so I suggest that uh, one day there has to be some sort of taking, scaling back this grand idea of defeating Russia and figuring out how to actually end this war in the Q Ukraine. And then go on punishing Russia if you want. But you, the war should really not be part of that uh, strategic strategic agenda for the United States. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.